Uh, welcome, everyone. It's already 6 o'clock, so we're going to start, and people can catch up. And uh, let's open in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace and for your love for us. We thank you for this new day, this new evening for us as we come together and as we really seek to understand uh, hermeneutics, which is a biblical interpretation, just really seeking to understand the method and and how to faithfully interpret your word so that we can uh, not just end with knowledge, but that we can apply it to our lives, that we can see our lives transformed, that your spirit can work, work to transform our lives, and that also we can we can uh, proclaim your word to those around us and, and their lives can be transformed. We, we trust in the work of the spirit, the work of your word. It's not us. We, we, we cannot change the heart of anyone. And so we just ask as we continue to study these deep truths that you would give the students uh, peace, that they would have uh, guidance and that they would be successful in their studies. It's in Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things in faith alone. Amen. Okay, so welcome to our fourth session, and I'm really excited about tonight. I've been preparing a PowerPoint and, and working through some things, so I'm really excited. Uh, I think some people are stressed because of, of the assignment. I'm stressed also because I'm preparing a lot of different things, so uh, we're stressed together. But anyway, God is good, and he will bring us through it. And uh, I really hope and pray that tonight can be just a great time of learning. And uh, I was really blessed preparing, and I, and I felt I felt as if things were coming together. So let's just go ahead and get started. We are into session number four. In session number four, the two big things I want to accomplish tonight, by God's grace, it might not happen. We'll see. We'll, we'll be led by the Spirit, but we, we do want to... To, to go into Romans 1, 16, 17, I just read the, the first several steps to you, the, the final product, but now we want to take a step back and work through how I came to those different things and uh, those different conclusions, those descriptions, those paragraphs. And I hope that you can see an example and then start to apply it to your, to your passage. And then we do want to go over the reading. So the reading that was last week that we did not get to, we are going to go over the rules and definitions for interpretation. So uh, maybe not so much the definitions because there's different definitions and we're not using that book as a complete textbook. So, but, but there is some significances from the reading. I also want to get your feedback and, and, and hear from you. So I'll have some questions. And so Lord willing, that will be that, that will be the, the second portion of our lecture tonight. So let's go ahead and just uh, a quick overview. We want to um, uh, look at the application. So we have an application for EVST. So I will go over it first. And uh, everyone will need to fill that out. And uh, I'm very excited about it. Henry and myself, we worked hard to prepare this application. Since, since we are officially a school, we, we need to start taking academic records. And so we'll go over that tonight. And that will be part of your homework. So your homework for next week will be to fill out the application. That will be part of the homework. So uh, we, we need to get those turned in. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be it's gonna be, it's gonna be great. <laughs> so next we'll do the questions. I want to answer some of the questions from your homework. And so we, we do want to go over the questions from the homework. So if you, have a, a, if you have a question, let's discuss that. I also want to briefly go online and just – review some of the the resources that we can that, you, that are available to you and just give you some clues on uh, on how to find them and then we are having we will have a research workshop this saturday and, and the focus of the research workshop will, will really be finding resources on the web so we'll talk through how to find different resources and, and also helping you to to find good good resources and even utilize those resources. So that will be this Saturday from two to three, but I will just touch base with you um, tonight on that. And then we also are going to, to, to take a step back and go through the process that I described to you and, and, and help prepare you for the background study, which you're going to be working on. And uh, I haven't yet decided if it's due next week or give you two weeks on it. Um, so I'm thinking about that. I probably won't make a decision until tomorrow morning. It really depends on how this, this lecture goes. 
something will be due next week, but but perhaps the, the final background m m might not be due yet. So we'll wait to see um, how it goes tonight. And then we are going to lastly discuss the highlights, just have a discussion, and also some of the highlights from the reading from last week. So we are a week behind, but but it's okay. All right, and then lastly, of course, the homework. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens tonight. Great. Okay, so really quick, questions from the homework. What questions do you have from the homework? Just general questions. If, if there are no questions from the homework that was due today, I do want to go over just briefly, uh, because I also practice, I also do the homework. Maybe you don't believe me, but I, I do do the homework as well. And so I do want to just briefly go online and just show uh, some things. So when I, I, when I click on Theology on the Web, uh, this I would say for all of us with the Cloud Resource Tool, there's many different uh, resources, different search engines, different uh, online libraries. This should be our primary go-to uh, resource, okay? And so we, we go on the Theology on the Web, and since we're doing, each one of you have a different passage of Scripture, you want to go to the biblical studies portion of this website. So if you look to the right, if you look to the right over here, you can see it. There's a link to biblical studies. I'm just going to click on that. Now, in clicking on that, that does not immediately get you into the website. You still have to come and zoom. If you can zoom here, there's, there's a link here that I'm just going to click on, okay? And so that's going to bring me into a different website, actually. And this is biblical studies, but it's really connected it's, it's part of the same. And now, for our purposes tonight, we're using Romans because we're going to be working through Romans 1, uh, 16 to 17. So if, if I go to, if I go to, to New Testament, um, because we're, we're looking at Romans, you would, you would click on uh, New Testament, and then I'm going to come down here to letters, okay? All right, so, so now that we're into... We're, I'm into I'm into Romans. Let me just double check here. I'm going to click on Romans here. So now there's a lot of resources here, and so you're probably thinking, which ones do I choose? Which ones are the good ones, Tim? Right. So I I I I don't want to go through all the specifics, but just looking here, um, I, I see there's this there's this course that's offered above. BibleBiblicalTrain.org. Later, we'll add that to we'll, we'll add that to the, the cloud resource tool. But one thing I notice here is before there's any commentaries, I see this this uh, word introductions. Introductions are very helpful because remember we talked just briefly about the background studies last week, and we were asking, well, how do I find the genre? How do I find the, the author? Uh, Introductions give you all that information. So an introduction will, will give will be more than one book. It will be multiple books. Typically, you have a New Testament introduction, or you have the Old Testament introduction, and then it gives all those specific all that specific information that you need. So just looking here, I'm going to click on this one right here, uh, Herbert uh, um, uh, Herbert Bate, and and uh, even though these books might look old, this is top scholarship. From, from the late 19th, 20th century. And to be honest with you, there's a few new things, but for the most part, they're saying the same stuff. And, and on, in, in the, the research workshop this Saturday, we're going to go into more of these details, but I'm just going to be honest. I mean, they're saying a lot of the same things. So, so this is going to be a good resource. Now you can, there's, there's a table of contents here, but I'm just going to download it. So I just click download and then it just immediately comes up on my web browser, all right? Now, we could, you could just look on the web browser or you can download it. If you're going to download it, uh, what you'd want to do is, there's a way to save as, or, or you can print as PDF. So in your options, this is my iPad, so I can't really use it here, but in your computer, you can look at the, the, the options on the left top, and you can actually print it as a PDF or it'll, there'll be an option to save as PDF. Okay, but then just coming down here, a guide of the epistles of St. Paul, I'm going to go down to the table of contents, and then, and then if you notice right here, this is, this is, all, of the, this is all of Paul's epistles introduction. So, so I'm looking at Romans for, for our purposes, 
and uh, it's right here, page number 116. When I go down there, <clears throat> we won't go down there tonight, um, but it'll give you all that background information, okay? It'll give you all the background information. So when you're looking for, for resources, uh, this is a great, a, a New Testament introduction will typically give you all that information. Uh, coming back here, let me just let me just back out here. So, so here we have different options. You have you have this world picture. You have a book picture. the the world The world picture is a journal article. We discuss the difference between journal articles and commentaries or books. A journal article is is dealing with a very specific issue. It's maybe ten to twenty five pages, maybe ten to thirty pages. It's essentially a research paper paper dealing with something specific. So as I just come down here, though, these are all journal articles that, that might touch on your topic, but, but they're very specific. But coming further down here, we have this, these commentaries, okay? Now, some of the commentaries you have to buy. So looking at the first one, C.K. Barrett, it's a great commentary, but you have to buy it. So most of us won't buy that commentary. But then looking down here, there are some really good, uh, some really good commentaries that uh, um, that are not that are free. So, for example, here uh, this this commentary, the Epistle to the Romans by Hanley Mule. Hanley Mule is an excellent Greek exegete. You got this commentary; it's excellent. It's public domain. So, just follow that procedure, download it, and you have that's a great commentary to, to resource. Okay, yeah. So here uh, another another. I mean. Joseph Barber Lightfoot notes on the Epistle of Paul from unpublished commentary. So this is an unpublished commentary. It's his notes. Again, Lightfoot is is a top scholar. You're going to have very good information there. Again, it's public domain. So so you do want to be looking at you want to be looking at because I just noticed in in, in, in the your, the assignment some of you were really just downloading uh, journal articles. Your bread and butter for working and doing research is going to be in the commentaries, not as much in the journal articles, unless you're, de you're dealing with a topic. So just to kind of give you, uh, let me just pull out of here. So I did some other research, but let me just pull out of here. So I'm going to go now to my, to my cloud drive and just looking at some things I downloaded. There we go. So this is John Calvin's, uh, Commentary on Romans, translated by John Owen. And so this, this would be a top commentary. I just save it to my, to my cloud drive. And then what I'm going to do is I'm not going to read it all the way through. I'll go and look at the, I'll go, I'll go through and look at the, the table of contents. Anyway, typically you would, <laughs> I, I'll find it when, when we end this, but typically what you want to do is you want to go to the table of contents. You want to look for number one, introductory issues. And then number two, you go to your specific text. So, so maybe most of you know that, but when you have a commentary, you don't just read it like a book. You would go to your specific, the specific area for your text, and then you would you would read that you would read that area to really gain the information that that you would that you want to to use. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe they don't have a table of contents. That's strange. Um, but just moving along here, all of these I have. The expositor, the expositor's commentary, by um, the expositor's commentary. I found the pulpit commentary. So I had, I found about seven or eight. So expositor's commentary. I have the physical book of this. Actually, Pastor Henry, there's two copies of this up in the bottom. Okay. So expositor's commentary by Robert uh, Robertson Nickel. Again, excellent commentary. They're still using this as a resource tool. Um, free. <laughs> so so on, on theology on the web. So I would really recommend before you go, before you do any other type of, 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 of go, searching the web, I would really go to biblicalstudies.org UK through theology on the web. And then I would find there's Old and New Testament and I would find your specific area and I would spend time looking through here and specifically working for looking for the word commentary. Okay. The other thing you can do, especially because remember, I, I asked you to at least download two commentaries, the pulpit commentary and also uh, Calvin's commentary, not because we agree with everything, but because those are, those are, those are really good commentaries. 
and, and they'll be very helpful in, in at least giving you a context, giving you reasons you can agree or disagree for, for your research. The other thing you can do is this. The other thing you can do is this. So I'm just gonna go Google. I, I'm cheating right here and I'm giving you a clue, but I'm just telling you the power. So I'm just gonna type in here, uh, pulpit, commentary, Romans, PDF. Oh, there it is, right there. So I click on it. I just bypassed everything, just watch. There you go, there's the scan PDF from Cornell University, top, top Ivy League school in the US. Uh, <laughs> hold on here, so here. Uh, pulpit commentary on Romans, right there, by uh, Barnby. And um, I actually did some, uh, here we go. It's, here's the, so this is, this is the example. There's the introduction. He deals with authenticity, time and place. He's dealing with occasion of writing, origin of the Roman church. Just moving along here. I'm looking for it. Uh, extent of the Roman Church, organization of the Roman Church. I'm looking for it. Uh, mainly a Jewish, or so we're going to discuss tonight whether whether or not the, the 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 church at Rome was Jewish or Gentile. He's going to answer the question. Now maybe we won't agree with what he says, but it's right here. You you, you don't really have to read a lot. There's going to be these sections that you can find. Um, purpose of the epistle. So these are all introductory ish issues in your background study that will, be, that will be due next week. Okay, so what I'm trying to help us to see is that uh, it's not far, it's near. <laughs> the, the, the resources, the information is not far from us. It's, it, it's, it's near to us, okay? And so that's all I'll say, but, but really going back to theology on the web, finding those really good commentaries, because all the commentaries are going to be structured like this. Looking for the expositor's commentary, the, the pulpit commentary, John Calvin's commentary. Uh, Old Testament would not have expositors, but those three are, are going to give you a ton of information. Uh, it's going to be awesome. So uh, as you – as I, I wanted to share this with you so that as you start doing your background, you're not spinning your wheels trying to find resources. You're, you know, you're going to got questions. Uh, uh, you, you can really use these resources. Any questions or comments before we move on? I don't want to spend a lot of time here. Is this helpful? Is this making sense? But what I, what I hope that you can see is that the resources are online. They're very powerful. I was reading the pulpit commentary for Romans. It was giving almost the exact same content as uh, Tom Schreiner. <laughs> that, Tom, uh, Tom Schreiner is a very conservative, excellent com uh, commentator on Romans. And there were, there were, there were similar levels of, of information. So what I want us to see here is that, is that there are really good resources online this is a troubleshooting stage, so I'm going to figure out why why it's not uh, why it's not really coming up the way it should, the way it should. But um, we're, we're going to get it. Any other questions before we go on, or any other comments? Uh, Pastor Tim. Yes, go ahead. In, uh, maybe someday, or maybe later, or tomorrow, you could send us through uh, through FB. Uh, the your suggested commentaries the okay. right the author of these commentaries yeah because there are numerous so it would be difficult for us so that we can we can narrow down our studies yeah okay so how about this i want you to send me if you need help because not everyone needs help and everyone's doing different passages of scripture so if you want my recommendations from theology on the web or from uh ccl on, of some good commentaries for your passage you email me a request, okay, or Facebook message, and I'll and I'll get I'll get back to you with several, okay. So I'll, I'll leave the ball in your court. Send me a message, and then we'll we'll work on it together, and, and we can discuss that as well on Saturday in the workshop, okay. Great question, and 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 uh, thank you, Pastor Henry. Let's let's leave that for the research workshop. If you want to attend this Saturday, two to three p.m., I'll put a link tomorrow. 
we can go in more detail. Eden, Eden uh, Funchon, I think it's Funchon, it says that pulpit commentary is not in CCL, but in Theology on the Web. And so she gave a link. So you can look at the link that she sent. Uh, and so Eden, thank you. There, there is, it is on CCL because when you type in the Google, it's coming up the, that, the CCL website. So we just have to figure out how maybe it's hidden. Maybe they pulled it. Maybe they had to pull it off. I, I don't know. We'll figure it out though. Okay, great. So let's, let's move on. We, we do have to move on. We, we can't spend much more time on this. So if there's no more questions, we'll just move on to the next topic. I'll just finish the, the PowerPoint portion. And, and um, uh, again, just really quick, kind of bringing this back to a close, is that you're looking for in, books that, have in, that are introductions, introductions to the New Testament, Old Testament, and also commentary. So, so these are your bread and butter for background study, and then also really unpacking your text, okay? And uh, we'll do a workshop on Saturday to, to really kind of work through these things uh, more. And so I appreciate your patience and, and we'll get it. And again, send me a private message if you want recommended commentaries on the web, on the web from your specific passage. Um, okay, let's, let's move on here. The, the one other thing I do want to share before we, we move on is that we do have, we have an application. <laughs> so, uh, so for those who are, uh, now, of course, um, right now, if when you fill out this application, if you are, if you're, if you're going to, if you were to, this semester, it's too late now to, to do anything with CGST. But what I want us to, what I want you to see here is that moving forward, uh, what, if for you or someone else is interested in applying, um, uh, we are offering these type of uh, these these programs here. So these are the different programs that we're offering uh, in, in some fashion. And if you were to apply for the MATC, you have to just go direct to CGST. But at least in the application with us, we have that context, so we know we know your 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 intention. So so this is pretty much all the different options that we're we're looking to move towards. Okay. So everyone's already registered in some form or fashion. So. I do want those who are registered not with CGST that are doing either the, the certificate in ministry through I-Team or the certificate in ministry uh, that we're uh, um, eventually, Lord willing, it's going to be through Baptist Theological School of Cebu. This is very similar to I-Team, but a step up. Uh, um, uh, we, we will need you to fill out an application for that. And then um, the certificate of theology is what most of you are taking. So you would just you would just click on that, and so pretty much what this gives us is this gives us all your information um, for for our record keeping purposes. Everything is 100 percent confidential. Confidential. We will not share it with anything. But this really helps us as we move to, as we take steps towards uh, different forms of accreditation. Uh, we we need to to be uh, uh, really maintaining good records and also seeing where the students are. Okay, and so this just goes through your your personal information, your your professional background, your educational background, and then there are some acknowledgement acknowledgements here that we're we're going to ask you to to, to 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 check off. And then uh, this is a fully online electronic PDF, meaning to say, when I send you the PDF, I put it on Facebook. If I email it to you, you can just type in your answers. So you'll be able to type in your answers here. Um, I haven't yet converted it, but I'll convert it. And you can just literally type it like a Word document. And then your signature is your typed. Your signature it will be your, your just your typed name. So I want you to type out your full name with the date, okay? So this will be a fully electronic uh, PDF application. And then we're just going to store it, okay, for, for our academic um, uh, records, okay? So the assignment for next week will be, will be assignment number three. Four, and this will be part of the assignment. So uh, coming back up here just very quickly, um, there are different available programs here. And um, the, the, the lowest level, because some of you, you can't commit to doing the homework. It, it's hard for you, but, but we do want to offer, we, you want the information. We want this to be a blessing for you. And so one thing we are going to offer is what's called a certificate of attendance. And so a certificate of attendance uh, would be a certificate that you would get complete at the end of, 
if let's say you were to, to, to follow through on the certificate of theology, you attended all the required and electives, but you couldn't do the assignments. Uh, you just attended all the courses. So you essentially received all that information. We do want to give you some form of certificate acknowledging the time of attending the class and the, the time for, for receiving that information. Okay. So a certificate of, uh, of attendance would be like auditing, but you, you're, you're taking all the classes, whether live or delayed on a video. Okay. So, so some of you have set, shared with me that you, you can't do the assignments. You're going to have to withdraw. Uh, a few of you have said that. And so one option could be no pressure, but if, but if you wanted a certificate of attendance that at least acknowledges, uh, Let's say, for example, Tim Spears. Tim Spears attended all of the classes, all the all the, the lectures for uh, for the certificate of theology. Okay, and so that could be something that you would have. It would be an acknowledgement that that you have at least received that information. the The, the certificate of theology is actually saying it's a, it certifies that you not have not only received the 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 information, the knowledge, but you've also put it into practice, and there's also testing that certifies that, yes, at a certain level, he, ha he has a working knowledge uh, practice and can, can, and can apply that knowledge in, in a ministry context. So that's what a, that's, that would be the difference between a certificate of theology and a certificate of attendance, or a, a certificate of a ministry and a certificate of attendance. The certificate of ministry of, of, of theology, Master of Arts of Theology, is not only certifying that you receive the information, but that you're, you, you, you practiced it and you have a certain level of proficiency. Okay, so the goal would still be for you to move towards that certificate or that master's degree, but we, we don't want you just to attend and sigh young. You have nothing to show for it, okay? So, so what I want, I want is each one of you just to pray and to think about uh, obviously, those that have already signed up, you've already given your Google form, so you're already in. You just have to sign. You just have to fill out the application because this really is just it's it's professional right now. All, all you are located is in an Excel spreadsheet. So we want. So for those that have already registered, I know this is very late, but this is you registered on Google Forms, but this this is for our our record keeping. You would just fill out. This would just be one time, and it would just move forward. Uh, you would not have to do this again. Okay, so I, I will post this on the, the Facebook group and You can just fill it out type it in and email it back to me with, along with your assignment You can email it with your assignment or separately. Okay, so uh, all those who are Attending this class at some level need need to even if you're just going to, to attend we, we do want this this uh, this certificate um, we do want uh, an application uh, Build out. Okay. Any questions or comments? Let's begin the next portion of, of the class tonight. And so we're, we're now moving into, uh, we're, we're going to split this up into two sections. The, the, the reading that we had from last, that was due last week, and then also working through uh, actually applying the method so you have an example to, to, to work with. And so before we, we get into the specific example of, of, now those are lofty goals. So we, we perhaps might have, we might not finish the reading. That's my goal. We'll see what happens. We, we do want to go slow as this is, a, this is an adjustment. And so before we get into Romans, I do want to talk through some introductory issues because there are, there are uh, different perspectives and, um, uh, you know, there's, we're, we're reading different authors. So, so, so I do want to just highlight several things that I think that are important. Maybe you agree, maybe you disagree with me. Uh, fair enough, but I, I do think that these are important introductory issues before we, we run, we, we step into the, the method. Now, I, I do want to say that those who are taking the higher level, the MAT and the MATC, that you are getting all of this in, in your reading. And so for those CT students that aren't, I am going, I, I want to share these introductory issues. Now, some of these, some of these issues are not included uh, in the reading. And so some of it is maybe unique. Maybe you haven't heard this before. D don't hesitate to stop me to ask a question. Perhaps it's something that you, you want to think more about. At this point, I just want you to, 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 to listen, to think, and definitely ask a question. 
and um, uh, let's begin. So uh, there are four there are four things that I want us to be thinking about before we start the the interpretative method that 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 we're using in, in class. And, and the and the first thing that I want us to consider is what's referred to as the historical grammatical approach. And so just to give a, a definition, just to give a brief um, paragraph of what is this historic grammatical approach, um, uh, it, it is to say, I'll just read this and then, and then, and then we'll take, take a moment to think about it. Uh, uh, scripture must be in, in, any text in scripture must be interpreted in accordance with the author and recipient's background and in agreement with the rules of grammar, syntax, and semantics. Uh, to restate this very basically, it is to say that scripture ought to be always read in its plain, literal, and original meaning. Okay, now this is a starting point. I am gonna add a caveat to this, but, but many interpreters, uh, for those who had the reading, you, you really picked up that there was this, uh, there's meaning behind the text, there's, there's uh, discussions concerning um, focus upon the reader, uh, and so there's these diff there's different places where people try to, to, to look for meaning. And so a good starting point that we should have in our, interpretation, in, in our interpretative method is this starting point that we should read the Word of God in its plain, literal, original meaning. Okay, so this is a starting point for us. Okay, so when I say grammar, syntax, and semantics, what I'm pretty much saying is uh, grammar refers to uh, parts of speech in a sentence. So you have subject, you have a verb, you have an, an object, you have prepositional phrases, you have adverbs, you have adjectives. Grammar and syntax is dealing with the relationships of those words. So those words mean something in a sentence. And then semantics deals with word meaning and, and then also uh, interrelationships between sentences. So, so the, the, big, the big takeaway, the big starting point idea that I want us to be thinking about is that we need to be reading, we need to be interpreting in, in agreement with the, the, the author, the author and the recipient's background and, and the meaning of the text, okay? And so it's plain, it's literal, and it's original, okay? So that's a very good starting point. So every one of us interpreting the Word of God, that should be our focus, okay? Our focus should not be on application. Application is a necessary outworking, but I, I do feel that, and this is across the board, this is true in the U.S., it's true in Europe, it's true here, that especially we, we want to help people and we immediately try to jump to the end game, to that application. And I want, us to, I want to draw us back and emphasize that, no, we need to be focused upon the, the, the text in its original context and in the context specifically of the author and the recipient. Okay, so that's, that's the first point that I wanna draw your attention to. Any questions or comments before we move on? The next thing I wanna draw our attention to is the reality, the reality that scripture, the, uh, there's, two, there's a two authorship nature of scripture. There's two authors of scripture, okay? And so if you were involved in the reading, we'll discuss this later, but Robert Stein really, uh, he really minimizes the divine. He says that the divine is only seen through the through the the human author. So the human author, uh, we'll we'll look at this this citation later. But so really, the human the the human author. We can assume that what the human author intended, the divine intended. There wasn't any bigger meaning that could have been intended, um, except uh, what the human author meant. Um, did anyone else pick up on that in the reading, or was, was that just something that, that, that I saw? Did anyone else see that, that quotation? Okay, well, we'll come back to it. I have it highlighted, so we'll, we'll discuss that. So, so um, this does, in a certain sense, put a little bit of a monkey wrench 
in, in a historical grammatical approach, solely a, a historical grammatical approach, because there, there's, there's, there's really two authors. There's the divine and there's the human. And just looking at that, you know, uh, from a logical perspective, I would be very surprised if, I mean, that's a strong, that's a strong uh, inference that the human, the, the, the human author must know the divine because uh, you look in, in parallel analogies in our own life. If, if, if I sent one of my workers, you, many of you uh, have workers, many of you have people underneath you. If, you. if you told them to send a message to give to someone else, for sure that messenger would not know the full intention of the, of, of the message. Maybe perhaps he knows most of it, but he would not know your mind. He would not know the full, full purpose, unless you really spelled it out to him. You could, you could do that. But to, to, to make that inference is, is a strong inference, especially when we look at Scripture. So we'll look at Scripture in a minute to, to see if this is the case or not. Um, so just really quick, um, uh, putting some more words here. This, this is a qualification for the above statement, plain, literal, and original meaning. Scripture always has two authors. Uh, it is it is incorrect to equate original intent of the one for the other, meaning the human author may or may not be fully aware of the full intent of the divine. Okay, so let's 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 look at this now for a minute. So, you know, I am disagreeing with Stein. This is a huge debate in hermeneutics. Okay, so so you have a lot of great uh, interpreters that that hold to this position. Let's go to one. Let's go to these two passages of scripture and just look at what the text says, and let's 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 reflect upon them for a minute. So let me let's go here to so look at ten. Let's let's we're looking we're looking specifically at verse ten to twelve concerning. So the context of First Peter chapter one is Peter is describing this great salvation that has been given to them, how their their faith is being tested and purified. Uh, so that it comes out with gold, that the salvation is being held by faith in the heavens. And then he says this, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the spirit in, in, of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they are not serving themselves but you in the things that now have been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things into which angels long to look. So this is really interesting. I'm just going to highlight you have, you have this uh, – uh, this, these, these are, in a sense, these are the actors, and then you have this, you have this uh, description here. Uh, the description is that they, is that they, they, this is the action they prophesied. So when you're looking at prophets, this is this is more than an exception. This is, this is the prophets. Right? So this is dealing with, with, a, with a large portion of Scripture. So this is not an exception, but this is, this is, this is a big... This is a big component. The prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, look at this. They, they searched and they inquired carefully, trying to understand. So, so what I want us to see here is that, uh, is that they, they, it was clear that they did not know. <laughs> they did not know. They're saying things. They're speaking. Uh, let's just be, let's quantify this. Uh, they are speaking more than they know. 
and, and, and the big takeaway is this idea down here, is that they're serving, they're serving you. Meaning to say that they're saying things that they don't, they don't know all the details. And so here, now there's debate. I mean, people will say, well, no, it's just that who the Christ was, but they knew everything else. But, but again, coming back is that the prophets, the prophets are speaking through the Holy Spirit, right? So, so it's very clear. There, there's, uh, look, at, look at this here. Um, the Spirit of Christ was indicating to them. <laughs> So this is the spirit of Christ is speaking through them. So here we have we have inspiration as well. We have inspiration here. The spirit of Christ is speaking, is indicating, or speaking to them, and they're trying to figure out what's going on. And and they 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 have to come to the realization: we're not serving ourselves. We don't know. This is for this is for for you, <laughs> the future. Okay. Now I don't. I don't want to go belabor the point. I, I, I want us to, to, what I want us to see is simply that, that according to this text, you cannot equate the intention of the divine author with the human author. Okay. That's all I'm trying. That's all I'm trying to say. Okay. And so you'll see where I'm going with this in a minute, but I just, I want us to see that in the text that it does seem that the prophets, they're on a need to know basis and they don't need to know, <laughs> you know at this point. Um, and, and we'll see why in a minute. We'll, we'll see why shortly, why they did not need to know. Um, obviously, the text is saying they weren't serving themselves. It wasn't, they, they, they were just to give the message. Um, uh, but I, I, I want to highlight that. And then we won't go to, 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 we won't go to 2 Peter 1.20, but it's saying something very similar. And it's speaking of, of, Again, this inspiration that the that the the spirit is working through the men, the prophets are being are being moved along. Okay. Uh, any comments or questions, or is this making sense? Okay, so let's so let's move on here. So, again, I just want to highlight. I just want to highlight that that the, the scripture has has a two authorship nature. And this is going to be very important moving into our third point. So the third point is this, the historical redemptive component, the historical redemptive component. So this leading us into the, into the, into the third point. Uh, the historical redemptive component, literally, we could say history of salvation. We're starting a class tomorrow night, the, big, the Bible's big story, uh, the gospel promise and revealed. And so we're going to really get into this history of salvation. This is just like, this is it there, okay? So... Uh, it's a plug if you want to join tomorrow night. But um, we'll be talking a lot of the similar things because we're setting up we're setting up the context. But I want to I want to highlight here that uh, this component recognizes that although all Scripture is the very words of God, or are uh, uh, all Scripture is the very words of God, not all Scripture holds the same weight. The Old Testament writers at times spoke better than they knew. And it was recognized that the full understanding would not come until the coming of the Messiah, the Holy Spirit. And so we just looked at 1 Peter 1, 10 to 12. Paul describes his gospel as that which was in the Old Testament, albeit hidden, now revealed. So let's go down to Paul to, 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 see, to see some of these examples in Paul. Let's go, to, let's go to Paul here. So Romans chapter 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. So gospel front and centered, he's, his purpose is specifically for gospel proclamation, which he, the he, of course, is the he is God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended by David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus our Lord. And so what we want to highlight here is this, this action of, this is the action, it's a promise, and 
the the means the means is the prophets the the means are the prophets so this is very similar this is very similar to first peter okay uh, and and this is and this is where is the location the location is here in the holy scriptures this here it would be a fallacy to equate this to the new testament the new testament doesn't exist this is referring to old testament this is referring to Old Testament, okay? And so many times we go to the New Testament to preach the gospel. <laughs> Could you preach the gospel from the Old Testament? Have you? We should be able to, okay? Now, now, this is the beginning of Romans, and you can say, okay, Tim, yeah, but the prophets knew about the gospel. Let's... Uh, this is a bookend. So the beginning is, is Romans 1, 1 to 5. The end from our PowerPoint is Romans 16, 20, 25 to 27. Let's go to Romans 16, 25 to 27. So now we're at the end of the book. So we just looked at the beginning of the book. Uh, Paul is set apart for the gospel of God, which God promised beforehand through the prophets in the Old Testament. Okay. Look at how he concludes. Look at how he concludes now. So these are bookends. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Christ Jesus according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages. <laughs> kept secret for long ages, but now has been disclosed by what? This is a mystery that has been kept secret for long ages, but now has been disclosed through what? The prophetic writings. So we can say here, we're looking at, we're comparing 1 Peter, Romans 1, and Romans 16. What we can say emphatically is that the gospel was present in the Old Testament, but not but not clear. Okay, it was it was it was there. It, it's not that it's a new plan. It's not that it's a new program. It was there, but it, it wasn't revealed until the Christ event, until the the the, the, the the crucifixion, the death, the resurrection, and the exaltation. And then it's it's like one of those you know those pictures you look at it. It just looks like a jumbled mess. And then as you pull it back and you stare at the corners. It just, uh, this beautiful picture appears like that. So what I want us to see though is, I, I, I want us to see here is that, is that um, when we approach, this is not a hermeneutical grid that I'm suggesting uh, and what many have not, but we've seen it, we've seen it in the history of interpretation, right? We, 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 we saw this where they're, they're looking at Christ in the Old Testament and we have now, explicit evidence new testament evidence that the gospel the preaching of christ the preaching of christ the gospel that it was this mystery that was kept secret for long ages now has been disclosed and it's through the prophetic writings and so um uh we need to consider this especially when we're interpreting the old testament especially when we're interpreting the old testament this is not a uh this is not uh, this is not allegory. This is not an allegorical interpretation. This is not a, a grid that we're applying over all the scripture. We're specifically looking at the Old Testament post cross. Sorry, post cross. We're looking. We're looking back at the Old Testament uh, and, and looking at at um, uh, how this was revealed. Okay, and so that's something that we need to consider in our inter interpretate, interpretative method. Um, and then lastly, the last thing I want us to, to look at is this theological validation. So all scripture when being interpreted must be done while being aware of Christian theology. That is to say one's interpretation is always in agreement with what theology teaches and says about God. This is especially true in the Old Testament context and especially in wisdom and prophetic literature. So again, we're, we're, we're adding a caveat to the historical grammatical approach because of this 
of this unique two, uh, uh, two authorship, specifically in the Old Testament and, and really especially among the, the prophets. Although it all, the prophets, my understanding is it would include the Pentateuch, especially since Moses was a prophet. So was, so was Abraham. Abraham, Abraham filled, fulfilled a prophetic role. Um, and so that's a, a discussion for another time. Um, but wisdom and prophetic literature presupposes one's fear and faith in Yahweh and now through Christ. Our interpretation and application should never be done in such a way that an unbelieving, moral, or good person could consistently leave our sermons or churches saying, Amen. If a, if a Catholic, uh, an unbelieving Catholic, uh, because there are some Catholics that are believing, they, they are, I believe they are believing and, and they, they live by faith, and so I wouldn't say all, but, but t- your typical Catholic, your typical Catholic, Someone from the Jehovah's Witness, someone from from a Mormon background, someone from another, uh, we would we would call them a non-orthodox church. They should not be able to sit in our sermon and sit under the preaching of the word, and and say Amen and feel comfortable leaving. Okay, uh, they should be very uncomfortable. <laughs> should be very uncomfortable. Okay, and and this is this is. This is very difficult, especially in the Old Testament, because um, many times people approach it in, a, in an historical grammatical approach without considering Christ. And now that we're post cross, we can ne- we we have to be looking at the Old Testament through uh, through a lens of Christ. Not saying that we're reinterpreting every passage we've discussed that in the past, but that we're saying, how does this passage relate to Christ? Um, because there are prophetic portions that might not be clear that, have been, that, that are now very clear post-cross. Any questions or comments? I don't want to rush this. Uh, anyone want to take a moment to ask a question or, or ask a clarification? I don't want to lose anyone. Is this making sense? Hi, team. Yeah, hi, Alex. Yeah, it does make sense. Deuteronomy 29, 29 talks about it, that there are things that are revealed to us and there are things that are not revealed to us. It does make sense. Yeah, yeah, good. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I, I do want to say this. This is this forms somewhat a, a, a foundation for then what became allegorical interpretation. So you can kind of see like, hey, I see where they get it, and they just ran with it. So we would want to say, no, 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 you're going too far. And then other people, they're so afraid of, of a non-literal original context that they, that they really just like, we're very safe over here. I'm, I'm six feet away from, the, I'm, 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 I'm 10 feet away from the wall, so I'm safe. And so they're, they're very afraid to, to, to walk that line. And we want to say, no, our Old Testament interpretation needs to be more than just its original context because there are things in there that have that have come to light with the Christ event. Uh, no, we can't run into allegory. Allegory is wrong, and so we, we need to find that we need to find that 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 line. So we want to start with the historical grammatical, but we also want to consider Christ at every time. And so I have included that in the method. So that's that's. I just wanted to give you a a context. I want to give you a foundation as to why we're doing what we're doing. And this, uh, because I know that, that Henry was also asking about, about the steps. So anyone else want to make a comment or, or, or ask a question? We'll, we'll move on in, in a short bit. Now I'm beginning to understand why hermeneutics is so difficult to understand because of the so many interpretations, so many modes, so many things to consider and only to not to accept it in, in some other ways, not acceptable, but uh, we need to study anyhow. Yeah, no, that's really good. That's really good. And I think that that is part of what what Blomberg, Stein, and Hubbard were saying, this this humility component. Like, we're just, wow, I am, I'm humble. Like, this is really a lot more, it's not black and white like I first suspected. So I, yeah, that's a great observation. That's, that's why that's why team I had a, a very strong 
ko observation when when uh, who was that author remember the uh, the comment i made on the yes, time yeah <laughs> between the interpretation of the constitution and law yeah. the interpretation of the bible yeah. being being used in a similar way because in reality it's far far beyond although there are principles that are similar but yeah. how to do it is very very different yeah. no excellent point yeah. hold the thought bring 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 up that observation later because I, Kuya Bobo had a really good observation about our reading and I, I, I want you to share it with the class so just 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 bear, bear with me bear with us so we'll come back to you okay great okay let's let's move on now so now that we've set the table I've set the table for us let us let us go into uh, I'm sorry that, that's out of line let, let's let's go into uh, Let's go into the method and its application. So we're going to Romans 1, 16 and 17. So the example text that we're going to begin is Romans 1, 16 to 17. If you have your Bibles, please turn your Bibles. If you have them on your tablet, your phone, your computer, turn your Bibles to Romans 1, 16 to 17. And uh, I will put it up on the screen here for us. I hope that everyone can see this. It's a little small, and I apologize for that. I hope you can see that. Uh, so we're going to work through this passage this will be our first example text through the semester. You will have yours, and we'll just take our time working through it. The word of the Lord says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it has been written, the righteous shall live by faith. So uh, all of this comes back into play, right? Our discussion, our, our introductory discussion, we have the gospel, we have salvation, we have righteousness, we have faith, we have an Old Testament citation <laughs> from the prophets, Habakkuk. So we got, we got the whole shebang here. And so uh, in Christianity 101, we, we just briefly worked through this text. So, so Henry is at a slight advantage, I think Louis as well. Uh, this is a foundational passage. This is, this is the passage that, that changed the Reformation. And so uh, it's uh, on a scale of 1 to 10 of passages of importance. This is, a, this is a, a 10. And it also has really all these different elements. So I really chose this passage for various reasons uh, for us to work through. And so uh, I'm hoping that this could be a blessing to all of us, not just in practicing the method, but also just seeing how deep how deep uh, the depth of, of, and significance of what is being taught here. So let, let's let's just take a moment to, we're going to go back to our PowerPoint, and then we'll come back and discuss this in, in due time. So let's go back to our PowerPoint. So we just read the text from, from Romans. And so what we're going to do now is I'm going to work through the steps, and as we work through the steps, we're just going to go in and to Romans. So I'm going to, talk through, I'll talk through uh, the steps, and then we'll have the example. So almost, if you remember a long time ago in mathematics, you had theory and application. So I'm kind of doing, <laughs> I'll give some theory, and then we're going to do the application in, in, in the text. So uh, the first step in our, in our method, again, there's different methods. Uh, there's no one right method for for preparing a sermon. This is a method that I've used. It's been helpful to me. Uh, I've changed this many times over the years. Maybe next year it'll be different. If you take the class again with me, you're like, Tim, it's a different, it's, you changed it. Yeah, because we all, uh, one, one book that you'll read later, it, it refers to the hermeneutical spiral. It's, you're, 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 spiraling, you're spiraling upward towards, towards true meaning. And so, or some people talk about a pendulum and so we're ever getting closer to that center. And so uh, maybe my, my method will change next year. So, but, th but this, is, this is just a method we need to use. And so it is helpful. And so uh, as we talked about before, and as you, I hope you practice in the homework, is, is to prepare spiritually. So you should have a time of prayer before you begin. And in the homework, I was really looking for two things, which I'll be grading on this week, is number one, that you confess your sin. Um, uh, well, I'll just bring it out here. So the, the first thing I was looking at is this confession, repentance, and commitment. And so before we study the Word of God, there needs to be this, 
this uh, this prayer of confession, uh, and then 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 a commitment, turning from the sin, and 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 committing, and, and maybe confession is after repentance, uh, you know. Uh, but but all three of these should be there. This confession of our sin, uh, cleaning ourselves before God, uh, turning from the sin, and, and committing to really following truth, and. And then the second component that I wanted in your prayer for you to write out is this request to be guided by the Holy Spirit through this interpretative process. And so there's a spiritual component that we talked about before, and there's also this, this, this science. And so I want us to pray that God would lead us. We follow the, 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 the procedure, but also that it's not purely, we're not purely doing it ourselves we are trusting in the Holy Spirit. And so in your prayer, I also wanted you to include this. And I actually included three more. I did include three more um, ideas that not for this assignment, but in the future, as you prepare, I do want you to consider. Um, They are number three. uh, uh, As you prepare your sermon, pray that the, that, that the goal of your sermon is that Christ and his name would be magnified and exalted. And so pray for this goal. Ask that in the sermon preparation, in your teaching preparation, in your Bible study preparation, in your small group preparation, that Christ's name would be magnified and exalted. And that also sets, sets us up that when we preach, no matter what topic, that we want to draw the, our audience to Christ. So maybe he's not explicitly in the text, but he's present by way of example. We talked about that before. Um, uh, Christ is our king. He's our Lord. He's our prophet. He's our priest. And so we always should be drawing our audience in some way to Christ so that whether it's by example, whether it's by teaching, whether it's by by, uh, literal fulfillment, whether it's by moral command, there's some way in which Christ is connected with that passage, whether in the Old or New Testament. Uh, whenever we preach the word, we're always we're always drawing the attention of the audience to Christ, and so that should be a, a prayer that we that we pray. It, it sets us, it gets us in this mindset of thinking about Christ. Um, and then number four, that the gospel would be proclaimed in some way. We should be including the gospel message in the sermon, in the teaching, uh, the gospel message that Christ died. For us, that is that he took our sins and and he gave us his righteousness so that we stand before God. We stand before God and he looks at us. He doesn't see us. He sees Christ. And this idea of union with Christ, what's true of the husband is true of the wife. And so we are the bride of Christ. And so um, we should always be proclaiming the gospel. So in, in the application portion, maybe in an illustration, maybe in an analogy, uh, in some way, we should be proclaiming the gospel uh, because without it, no one can do what you're calling them to do. Without the gospel, no one can do what you're calling them to do. And then lastly, that the word that, so the word that you're speaking that would accomplish its purpose in the hearts of the listener. There is power in the word. And, and, and uh, uh, we, we, we talked about this in Christianity 101. Uh, I'm, I'm going back to another class, but this idea that in, in the Thessalonian believers, Paul actually says that it's the word that's at work in their hearts. <laughs> it's the word that's at work in their hearts. So when we proclaim the word of God, when we proclaim the gospel, uh, you cannot affect change. You cannot manipulate change. It's the word that does it. And there's always two purposes. The word, uh, maybe this is a hard saying to accept, but especially in the prophets, the word of God always has a twofold purpose, and it's always successful. It either creates belief or it hardens. It either creates belief or hardens. And the, the best example of this is in Isaiah 6, when he's told to proclaim the word, and the purpose of proclaiming the word is not to create belief, but it's to harden the hearts so that hearing they will not hear, seeing they will not see, until they are destroyed. And so um, that is very hard to accept, but the Word of God always accomplishes that which it set out, sets out to do. And so maybe we can discuss that another time. Um, suffice it to say that we should be praying that the Word would accomplish its purpose. 
in, in our sermon, in our preaching, in our teaching, in our Bible study. Okay, so that's the first step. Step number two, passage selection. So, uh, passage selection. Now, my recommendation is if you're teaching or if you're preaching, you know, I am more old school. You know, I think there's a place for topical. I think there's a place for biblical theological preaching. Um, but I think the bread and butter of the church is expository preaching. I think the bread and butter of the church is expository preaching and preaching through, uh, if you preach through expository preaching and you just go book by book, you can go different books, you don't have to go in order, but, but from the beginning of preaching to the end of your ministry, for you to be able to say that you preach through all the books of the Bible and a majority, if not all of the, the passages, you can, be ass you can be assured that that you will have preached the whole counsel of God. So I, I am somewhat old school when it comes to expository preaching. I, I do think that that should be the bread and butter. Again, I think there's a context and a place for topical. I preach topical. There's a place for biblical theological. Well, that, that maybe that's an advanced course some other time. But but there's places for different types of preaching. I don't want to minimize those other ones, but I do think expository preaching is primary. And so by saying that, if you're preaching expository, exposit, if, if you're using expository preaching, the passage chooses itself, okay? Now, you do, you do have some factors that you need to consider, and so those factors include, um, they include density of information in a given passage, okay? So uh, this could be too little or too much information, okay? So you need to determine uh, in choosing a passage of Scripture, you, you can't choose a massive passage that you can't handle in, in, a, in, a, in a lot of time. So you do have to consider how much information is in the passage, okay? Some passages of Scripture don't have a lot, and you can preach five or six or 10 or 12 verses. Others are so deep and dense, maybe you're only going to use one or two verses. Uh, Romans 1, 16 and 17, you should, not, you should not be preaching more than one or two verses because there's so much depth in those two verses. Uh, something else to consider is the genre of the text. So as you choose a passage, you need to be aware of the genre that you're, that you're preaching. You need to be consciously aware of that. Uh, number three, the time of your communication. So as you choose a passage, if it's a 10-minute devotional versus a 40-minute uh, sermon, you need to be considering that. And, and uh, expert preachers know that. And, and they just, that's just second nature, but especially for younger preachers that are taking off, we've all failed. I have failed visibly at this. I have not chosen wisely all the time in, in which sermons, uh, the length of sermon to preach. And sometimes I've gone way over and sometimes, uh, rarely I go short. <laughs> so most of the time it's too much. And after the sermon, the pastor will come and say like, man, I need to, you know, I need to, I need to recover from that. Like, I'm sorry. That was my mistake. So, so that is that sometimes it's just trial by error, a, a trial by uh, error, but we do need to be considering how long your communication is. And then lastly, uh, the, de or it's not lastly, but the depth of investigation. So you need to consider how deep you're going to go in the text. Um, it, uh, and this is connected with number five, the knowledge and level of audience. So depth of investigation and knowledge and level of audience go hand in hand. Meaning to say, you can't give really, you can't go really deep if you're not, if your audience are teenagers or they're new Christians. So you need to be really aware of your audience. You need to conscious, consciously be thinking, who am I preaching to? And then you need to make the adjustment. And, and, uh, we all fail at this, but we need to be thinking about uh, the knowledge and the level of our audience, especially in application and also in depth. Any comments or questions? Let's move on here. So passage selection. So you've already chosen your passage, so that's done, all right? And so this is really in the future. As you're preaching, as you're teaching, as you're doing small groups, you should always be, again, you don't have to write these out, but just in your mind, thinking about, okay, you know, I'm going into a 10-minute devotional. It needs to be very practical. You know, I'm going into a full sermon. The, ser the pastor is from a, you know, maybe he's from a fundamental Baptist. He wants a one-hour sermon. I need to make it long, <laughs> okay? Maybe it's in, a, it's in a church service where they're like 30 minutes and you're done, okay? So then you need to really make that adjustment. You need to be, you need to be aware of that. Uh, next, uh, location in salvation history. And so this 
this comes back to that two authorship. This comes back to the historical redemptive, uh, the, the historical redemptive uh, context. You need to be aware where your passage is in relationship to salvation history. What is the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament? Can we purely read the Old Testament without considering the person and work of Jesus? And so we've are, these are questions that, again, I'm bringing them again to your attention because in this process, I want you to be aware. Now, you would say, Tim, I got it. But you'd be surprised at how people say, yes, I understand that. And then when you get down and right, you don't include Christ. You don't consider Christ. And so I'm just uh, – Rep repetition is our best teacher. And so I want us to be thinking about when you write out this third step, where is your text in relationship to salvation history? And, and uh, um, how are you, how is Christ connected? And so, and so this is where uh, we don't have time to go here tonight, but I'm going to just put down some passages of scripture that you can look up on your own time. Some of these we've already looked at, uh, Look at how they describe Jesus and the relationship with the Old Testament. Matthew 5, 17, I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. Romans 10, 4, Christ is the end of the law. Okay? Luke 24, 25 to 27 and 44 to 45. Everything that was written about the Christ in the, in the prophets, uh, the writings, and the law must be fulfilled. And it talks about how he opens their eyes to see the scriptures. And so, again, uh, I'm, I'm really emphasizing here the need that in the Old Testament, uh, if you're looking at explicit references to Christ, it's very few. If you're looking at explicit references to Christ, it's very few. If you're looking for Jesus, it's, it's not really there, except, except Joshua, if you're going to use the name Joshua. But he is all over the, the Old Testament in, 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 in prophecies, in types, in shadows. And so we need to be looking for those. And we need to be, we need to be uh, 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 considering that. And so this is a plug. Next semester, we're doing biblical theology. Biblical theology through CGST. So our class, this class semester is hermeneutics. Next semester is biblical theology. We are going to get into this. We are going to, this is a whole class on, on this. And so it's a plug for next semester. And, and we'll also deal with this in the Bible's big story. So uh, for tomorrow night, but we're going to really go deep. Tomorrow night will be more practical, but next semester, biblical theology, we're going to go deep and really look at, at the revelation and how it's connected to the coming of Christ. And so um, for now, just t write these passages down, do your own study on your own time, and then maybe you have a question, you can send me a private message, or we can discuss it next week during the time of questions, uh, question and answer. Okay, and then lastly, Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 22. And so Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 22, really in the law, there's a loophole, you know, maybe loophole is a bad word, but uh uh, not a good word, but there is a, there is an exemption. There is a qualification that there is a prophet that is coming that is going to fill up the law. You're going to listen to him, okay? And so that prophet is Jesus. So what, that's what I'm trying to say. This is not allegorical interpretation. This is intrinsic in the Old and New Testament. There's this prophet that's coming that's going to tell you all things. He's going to fill out the law. You're, you're to listen to him. And so in, in, in the law, in the writings, in the prophets, you have this, this, this anticipatory, this, this, uh, this seed in the Old Testament that's going to come into a flower in the New Testament. All right? And so I, I'm, I'm trying to emphasize here that, that Christ is present the Christ is present in the Old Testament. And so, again, point number three, you need to be putting this into your mind so that as you work through your text, in, especially in the Old Testament, you will be considering that. Any questions or comments, or is this, again, uh, I don't want to go too fast. Okay, let's go on here. I just, I sometimes scroll through to make sure. All right, so step number four. So we're moving along here. Okay, so, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll move on here. So there's, 
So then we talked about this before. Uh, where is my text in relationship to the history of redemptive, in, in relationship to the history of redemptive history? Okay, and so uh, maybe it's a double, maybe I could have worded that better, but we mentioned this before that we have several eras to consider. Again, I'm not trying to promote a, a particular, a particular framework. That would be for a different class. I'm not trying to, to, to push any, any buttons or anything, but I just, I, I just, we need to be thinking about where your text is in, in these major eras of, of salvation history. So pre-Abrahamic, pre where really uh, that's Genesis 1 to 11. Then you have, you have the pre-Old Covenant, Old Covenant era. You could refer to that as the patriarchs. Uh, it's, it's during the era of the Abrahamic Covenant, but uh, anticipating the Old Covenant. Then you have the Old Covenant era. So that's really from Exodus all the way until intertestamental. Exodus all the way until Jesus, okay? Up until even post-cross, you still have the Jews, pat the Jews, practicing the Old Covenant, and according to Hebrews, the Old Covenant is fading away. I mean, it has not yet faded. It's fading away and ready to disappear. So you have this Old Covenant era, and then you have the life and ministry of Christ, and then you also have the New Covenant era. And so we talked about before how if your, ser if your message is in the life and ministry of Christ, you still have to be very careful how you interpret because there are things that Christ does that are not, they are descriptive, they're not prescriptive. You'll often hear me say this. They're descriptive, not prescriptive. So, for example, the messianic secret, don't tell them who I am, my time has not yet come. Um, he tells them not, he, he does not openly declare who he is. Uh, if we tried to practice that today, we would be disobeying, right? Because we're, we're commanded to preach the gospel to every creature. And so there's examples in the life and ministry of Christ where we really have to navigate carefully. We have to interpret work very carefully through them because there are things occurring that are not that's a major uh, um, event in salvation history that cannot be duplicated that it, it's not meant to be duplicated okay so you have to be aware this again is also the case um, I didn't include it here but the, the the apostolic era and especially in acts you know there's debate here fair enough but some of the early church's practices is, again, descriptive, not prescriptive. And so you have to be very careful what's descriptive and what's prescriptive because there are things that occur in the, in the first century church that we don't practice today. One example, they cast lots <laughs> for, the, for, the, for the 12th apostle in Acts 1. How many, how many people here in church when you're electing elders and, and deacons, you cast a lot. <laughs> what, who does that? <laughs> Don't think, no one does it, right? <laughs> because because there were there was the spirit was working in, 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 in a, a tremendous way. You had you had fire floating over their heads. So there there are things occurring in Acts that cannot be duplicated today. So again, I just I'm offering this caveat because we need to be careful. And so we have a specific uh, step to kind of safeguard us, to, to, bring, to make us aware that, okay, I'm not yet in the full new covenant um, uh, era, so I need to be contemplating. So perhaps we could, we could separate two other eras. You could put the, the, the new covenant uh, apostolic and then new covenant with a closed canon where the, the Bible is already closed. You could, you could do that. That's more helpful. Only to say that it also guards in our interpretation. A any comments or questions? I don't want to rush. Maybe I've said something that someone wants to ask. Uh, this is just a side note. In, in yeah. ancient Philippine law, when there are two candidates in tie, this Kuya Boboy knows this, that the casting of lot is acceptable. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No one, no one has the strength to cast a lot for church leaders, though. <laughs> you want to know who's going to be your leader, right? <laughs> goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my word. Okay, let's move on here. All right, so number four, step number four. Oh, we got one more. Okay, there we go. Sorry, that was a genre, genre identification. So Ray, Ray's question last week was concerning 
the genre type. So I do have a, uh, I do have a, a list of, of, of genre here and let's just talk through here. Um, so, so the question you want to ask is what is the genre of my book? And then number two, what is the subgenre of my passage? So what is the genre of my book? And then also what is the subgenre of my passage? If you're working in the new Testament, this is, kind of like, well, Tim, it's so obvious. Well, fair enough, but when you get to other places, it gets much more difficult. And so again, the, the, the procedure is including all of scripture, okay? So I have just a list here of different genres and different subgenres. Kuya Ray asked for the list, and I had a list from an old hermeneutics class, and I was looking at the list, and I was like, ah, oh, it's kind of deficient. And then I started looking through several of my literary books, and it, there's just not a, a, a solid list and there's debate and there's this or that. So what I want to say is that this is a list, please write it down, but it's not comprehensive. And these are, these are debated. So some people would disagree. There's some people have just have a list of four. Uh, so again, this is just different examples that I found. I would really recommend looking first in your commentaries to see what they describe Number one is the book, and then if they describe the specific passage of scripture. So just talking through here really briefly, you have historical genre. That's, that's like historical narrative. Um, Genesis 1 through 11 would be historical narrative. You have law, uh, and really the, the, the law of Exodus through, through Deuteronomy, it's like law mixed with, narr with, with narrative events. So it's really a unique structure. Um, not so unique to, to the ancient Near Eastern background, although it's still, you know, some people would say it's not. I mean, there is, there is differences and similarities, but with, without getting into all that, there is a law genre where it's giving specific commandments, and that really is addressed in, in Exodus, uh, Exodus, uh, Exodus through, through Deuteronomy. You have narrative, and so narrative is really close to historical. So, you know... <sighs> If you in your if in your project you you listed your passage as narrative versus historical, I probably wouldn't take off points because again there's debated points. Some people use narrative, some people use historical. So uh, fair enough. It's just it, there's nothing concrete because there is overlap here, and then there's there's no set standard. So um, what I'm trying to get at is you can't approach this with like a black and white. In some instances, it is black and white. In other areas, it's somewhat gray. And, and some of it is just, it's, it's uh, you're splitting hairs. Narrative and historical narrative is almost the same thing. So, you know, um, I'm including both because maybe you won't, in your reading, you won't see historical, you just see narrative. So that's why I'm also including several, okay? And that, that also goes with wisdom and song. They would say that, you know, oh, well, you know, so song is just poetry or wisdom. There is no song uh, literary. So fair enough, you know, but I'm just, I'm including the possibilities in case you, in case you, you, you see one and not the other. Okay. And then gospel, gospel, there's debate. I, I do think gospel is a unique narrative, um, a, a unique genre and it's really, there's not really a lot, anything like it in the, in the ancient um, world, especially in the Greco-Roman context. And uh, um, it's, it's, it's an awesome, it's an awesome combination of, of the life, the life events, and the, the, the teachings and the works of, of Jesus Christ. And so, um, yeah, some people call it bios. If you see a bios, bios, B-I-O-S as well. Um, I just have gospel here. And then you have epistolary. And um, again, this is where you get into debate apocalyptic. So I am a very conservative. I don't like the, 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 the identification of apocalyptic uh, in, in, uh, in the, the scripture. There is an apocalyptic genre, especially in the, in the pseudepigrapha and extra biblical writings. There's really, there is really a, a, a apocalyptic type uh, uh, genre, and they would say Revelation's apocalyptic. I think some, uh, some, some scholars will say Revelation is an epistolary prophetic apocalypse. <laughs> Combine the three. I think Osborne says that, and maybe G.K. Beale. I, I can't remember now. But 
I, you know, when it comes to Revelation, I don't call it an apocalypse, and I don't call it, a, it does have the epistolary nature, but when you just read the text, you read the text, the author of John wants it to be known as a prophecy, the words of this prophecy. He mentions prophecy multiple times throughout. The, if you just read the words of, of John the writer, he's very emphatic. This is a prophecy. So I, I do think in one sense, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying New Testament writers uh, are, are doing are, are malicious, but uh, do we take him at his word? And so John, the, the, the writer of Revelation, wants it to be known as a, a prophecy. And, and I and I do think that's the case for all the prophetic books. They 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 self-identify. <laughs> They self-identify as a prophecy, and they have those prophetic, those prophetic categories. So, um, from a conservative perspective, I, I don't, I would not use the the genre of apocalyptic. But again, that's that's my that's my view. And um, if you had apocalyptic, I wouldn't take off. I wouldn't be angry with you. That's just that's just my view. For a while, I I liked apocalyptic. So, there's a journey there. Uh, any comments or questions? Maybe this is going over your head. I'm just including it. Since we do have some, we have different levels of 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 people here. Any questions or comments so far, or is this? Are you kind of tracking with me here? Uh, Pastor Tim. Yes. Yeah, Henry. In, if we fail, if we made an error in in analyzing the genre, will it change the interpretation? So, so. It is, yes and no. It de it depends. It really depends. It really depends on. Um, uh, I do have an example somewhere of where where it does. I think in the reading. So it, it, it can, I'll give an example in the reading from from Stein. He gave the example of of the parable of Lazarus and the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. He says the parable is inappropriate to interpret it historical narrative. Um, and so people who interpret it historical narrative, they draw all these facts and truths about the afterlife, and they say it's inappropriate. It's just a parable. You're, you, you've interpreted it wrongly. So that would be one example. You know, I've gone, I, I took it as a historical narrative, just a parable, and then I'm kind of back more towards in the middle because, you know, there are some things that make it a unique parable that are not typical of parable. The, the names are, are very unique. Um, even if it's a parable, it's still speaking from a, from a worldview of heaven and hell. So, yeah, I want to say that it can make, it definitely can make a mistake. We do have to be careful, but I don't want, I don't want you to feel like you're living in fear where like, I made a mistake. My whole interpretation's wrong now. I don't want you to have that perspective, but it does, it does matter. There is consequence, but I don't want you to f live in a fear where, uh, if I make a mistake here, everything else is wrong. Okay, I, do, I don't want you to, 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 to feel like that. But but it, a failure to identify genre could have could have a could result in a bad. There is that potential. I I have a question. Yeah. Uh, can you give us an example where the genre is a very important factor in the interpretation? Yeah, uh, Revelation. I think Revelation is a perfect example. I think that people have misinterpreted it because they don't treat revelation as a prophecy that has visions. They, they, they're trying to interpret uh, literal, literal, like the scorpion is helicopters, the whatever is a tank. And that's, that's a terrible interpretation. It's not meant to be read like that. So yeah, I mean, revelation would be the, would be the big one. <laughs> uh, the Olivet discourse as well. I think that people, I think, that people have misinterpreted the Olivet Discourse because again, they don't understand um, the nature of prophecy. I'll give one example. We'll discuss this later, maybe in this class, but um, yeah, we'll, 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 when we get to Revelation, we'll discuss this. Prophecy has an intrinsic uh, multifaceted layer of meaning. So there's, there's it, it, when you read, like let's take the Olivet Discourse um, or even Isaiah, when you read it, there's clear, fulfillment in the near future it's near future like that that sounds like their time and then it's like and then like the next verse it's like the end of the world and there's never going to be a time as bad as this it's like 
you have these near fulfillments and then it's almost like this near fulfillment is like now the end of the world. And so you have this multiple layer of fulfillment and that's the design of prophecy. That's intrinsic to prophecy. So you know what? I'm going to have some diet. When we get to prophecy, I'll have some diagrams to better, to better diagram that. But I do think that people don't understand um, the, how the nature of prophecy, and that leads to very bad interpretations as well. So I'd say revela uh, revelations of prophecy, that's my interpretation. Um, and also all the prophetic books are taken, can be taken out of context. So, yeah. Um, what do you think, Bo Boy? The Song of Songs. What about the Song of Songs? Uh, does it... You can you can you put it in a similar context, the song of songs, because while it's a good one. Actually, the content is not a song. Yeah, so the song of songs is another one. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a huge two radically different schools of interpretation, and they have totally different meanings. So it, it, it impacts. You're absolutely right. And and also Genesis. There's huge debate in Genesis one to three, historical narrative or non-literal. So you're 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 asking the right question that there that not I so going back to Henry's yeah you, you could fail to identify the right genre you could have very bad very wrong interpretation. I should think. Yeah, you're good. This is Alex. Yeah, go ahead. It's getting it's getting interesting. Uh, <laughs> can you go back to your? You took the illustration of the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Yeah, yeah. And that's a parable, right? It's a parable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you give us your personal insight about this parable? Because that parable, like, somehow descriptive of the heaven and hell. And there's a great custom, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah what yeah. is your personal insight to that? Yeah. Conservative interpretation would say it's just a parable, just describing the, the fact that Really, I mean, when you look at the parable, the point is that the, the, the rich man, the riches and his lifestyle and his behavior exemplified a man of no faith, a, a no faith and no humility. Faith and humility is really a theme through the, through, through the gospel of Luke. And the outworking of this, of this lack of faith and humility is someone who lives in wealth. Okay, so people will use that to then say, okay, all of people who have wealth, they're wicked. Um, but when you re read closely, it's not saying that. It's, it, um, it's referring to those that are unbelieving and they're prideful people that, and, and, and one of those results is wealth, okay? So, but, but the parable is primarily teaching that, that Lazarus is a man of faith and, and the rich man, even in his suffering, is unbelieving and, and lacks humility. In, in the fire, he says, go tell Lazarus, to wet his tongue, or his finger, so I can get away. He's still trying to command Abraham and Lazarus what to do, and he's in hell. And so you really see this. You really see this. Um, this inside out. So the la so so the rich man thought he was in, but he's out. He's he's in torment. But again, it's coming back to this lack of faith, lack of of humility. These these signs of true belief true trust, which is a theme, you, you have to look at it in the context of the larger context of, of Luke, because there's multiple stories, there's, there's multiple um, teaching, you know, uh, the, the door will be barred, there are people kicked out of the, out of the, out of the, uh, of the supper, the, the final supper. Um, but what I want to, but what I want to, what I want to draw your attention to is that that would be a very conservative, uh, safe reading. I do think that Jesus is describing what's unique is that there that there's Lazarus name is mentioned, which is like, why would that be? In most parables, there's no names. There's no names mentioned. So that's unique. And then the other thing is the fact that they are speaking from a worldview. And so I do think that you could draw cautiously truths about heaven and hell, because even though it's a parable, Jesus is still operating from a worldview in describing the parable. So that's kind of where I'm at. Maybe I would change my perspective later. I definitely would not go to the parable first to say this is what the Bible teaches on heaven and hell. I think you could use that to support other more important texts. That could be a support of other primary texts. I would not use it as a primary text to describe heaven and hell. I would talk about faith and, and the outworking of, 
of a lack of faith um, um, and a lack of, of humility, which is a, which is a sign of, of, of faith as well. That's what's primarily being taught. And, and then the result, which is, which is eternal damnation. If, okay, uh, going to that verse, the para, uh, parable of the rich, uh, 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 the rich man, okay. Let's say <clears throat> I choose it's uh, prophetic, then the subject is parable, the parable, parable. parable. A, par, a parable. Then uh, the parable that I use, let's say, I use it as uh, the subgenre is theological discourse. Yeah, so Am I wrong? You, you wouldn't be wrong because in the text it's calls it a par I think it calls it a parable. Maybe it doesn't call it a parable, but it, but it's I, it's written as a parable. So I would not. I would say, especially in that section, I would not call it a theological discourse. Romans is a theological discourse because it's 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 a, it's a, it's it's He's teaching theology, and then there's application after. So it's uh, you could you you could say the, the it for the the Lazarus, the parable of Lazarus either a parable or it could be like a narrative because there is a series of narratives where Jesus is talking to different people, and then so I would say either narrative or parable. That's what I would use for the sub genre. Uh, can can it be also an apocalyptic? It could not be apocalyptic because apocalyptic is very specific, and we'll we'll discuss this later. Apocalyptic is very specific for vision; it's visionary. So so apocalyptic, you know, people would say like Revelation, where you saw these visions of of a dragon and on the side of the mountain, or you saw a vision of the Son of Man. That's more apocalyptic. Yeah, it's not. Uh, yeah, it could not be. No. But but here's the big takeaway. For for the parable, if you're going to call it a parable of Lazarus and the rich man, what I'm trying to get at is because it's not theological discourse, because it's not prophetic, because it is a parable, the, 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 now that's debated because I don't know if it actually says parable, although it, maybe it does. But, but regardless, a parable has a very specific, right? It's an earthly story teaching a heavenly meaning, okay? So I would be looking for that one truth that the story is telling and that one truth is that a life of faith results in humility a, 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 a lack a, a life of independence and lack of faith results in pride and ultimately damnation and even in damnation you're still prideful you're still telling people what to do you're still unbelieving okay um and 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 it um so so for example, in, in, in my teaching on the parable, if we're going to call it that, parable of Lazarus and, and the rich man, my focus would not be on describing hell. It would be focused on faith, humility, and, and that warning that a lifestyle, a lifestyle of, 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 of faithlessness and pride is going to lead to damnation. That would be, that would be, you see how it's a totally different trajectory. If it's a theological discourse, I'm teaching on hell. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I'm focusing on what hell is like. Um, but that's not the primary purpose. It's this earthly story of someone in hell suffering because of his pride and lack of belief. Any other comments or questions? I hope this is helpful. Okay, so now let's apply this to Romans. Let's apply this to Romans. Okay, so now we're going to go into the, we're going to go into the, the, the text of Romans. So let's look at, let's look at Romans here, okay? So um, I identified the genre. We're going to take a break in, in, in just after this question, but I applied epistolary genre to the book. And so if you read in, in the introductions, if you just read the book of, of Romans, you can really see that it's epistolary in nature. That's the genre, okay? Now, in my example I gave last week, I'm going to actually print it out, and I'll put it on the, on the group page, my, my writing. I said it was epistolary genre as the main book and also the subgenre okay and that that was the safe route that is the safe route because that is true it's that's the that's the genre now i did some more research this week and <laughs> there are other possibilities that actually i might change my answer so so the, <laughs> i don't want you to have i don't want you to say tim you're changing your answer how could you know you're someone who knows and you're making a mistake um I want us to see that these are not, this is not hard and fast. Okay. This is not hard and fast and we can further qualify. So I did, I did, I wanted, it's epistolary genre and, and some commentators would just say epistolary genre across the board. 
But when you look at Romans, there's, there is really two subgenres in, in Romans. And when you look at other commentaries, that's the case. In Romans, you have a theological discourse. So there's many characteristics of a theological discourse, especially in Romans 1 to 11, there's hardly if any commands. It's just all teaching. There's very little commands, okay? Um, compare that with Romans 12 to 16. If anyone who reads it, it's completely different. There's tons of commands in Romans 12 to 16. And so there's really, uh, Romans 1 to 11 is really this theological discourse giving us theology. And then 12 to 16 is really giving us like application or commands. Now I've taught the course of Romans before and I've actually called it the gospel described, the gospel applied, okay? But what I want to say is that um, thinking more, you know, I wrote, I wrote my, my assignment and I just, I went the safe route, but the more I was thinking about it, I would make the subgenre for Romans 1, 16 to 17. The, the, the subgenre from Romans 1 to chapter 11 is theological discourse. Now, it doesn't really change anything because epistle, epistles have both theology and, and practical. So I'm not say it's not a switch from like apocalyptic to epistolary. It's more of a, a specificity. I'm, specif I'm going into more detail. I don't know if that makes sense. So I don't want you to become afraid or I, I, I guess I, would, I want you to see is that there is some fluidity. Uh, in hermeneutics, they call it both a science and an art. So there's some objectivity and then there's also some, there's some flexibility there, okay? And so I don't want us to think, oh, there's, there's no meaning I've lost. And I don't want us to think, oh, it's all black and white. There, 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 is, some, there is some leeway and I'm, and I'm giving an example here. Does anyone want to ask a question or make a comment? Yeah, you're making sense, uh, Pastor Tim. The more you keep on meditating that verse, it's just keeping, uh, it's just popping out deeper. So the specific or the details of that uh, genre is just coming out. Good. Okay. Good. Th thank you, Henry. And and so I I, I do want us to I, I want to give some assurance to each one of us here tonight that. Um, we should hold our we should hold our core doctrine and truths with a closed fist. Uh, our interpretation, as we're in, in, in the details, not so tight. We should be willing to learn. We should be willing to adjust. I've given an example where I'm making a modification. So I make modifications all the time. We, that's part of the learning process. We stop learning when we start when we stop making adjustments. Okay, when we stop making adjustments. So there are there are some core. Salvation by grace alone. We need to hold that with a fist until we are dead, okay? Um, the, the genre of the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Okay, L loose fist. Maybe, maybe open palm. <laughs> maybe open palm, okay? So I, I, I do want us, to, I want us to see the difference there. Uh, hermeneutics is both a science and an art. So we're through, we're through four steps, okay? And so I hope that this is helpful. I hope that this discussion of genre is helpful. And really, identifying the genre sets the table for the direction and the expectations that you are to have. And if you notice, if you go back to our syllabus, the, hat, the, the second half of hermeneutics is we're going to go through all these different genres. So right now you're like, Tim, what am I going to do? Don't worry. We're, uh, we have the specific, we'll go through wisdom. We'll go through poetry. We'll go through prophecy we'll go through all these different genres and give you some more clues give you some recommendations um so don't be stressed we, we will get there right now we're just trying to get the basics and, and, and get one passage under our belt um it's already 8 20 so oh my goodness time is fleeting from us let's take another seven minute break it's already 7 20 uh 8 27 so I'm not sure if we're going to get to the reading. We'll see about that. We'll see what happens here. I do want to focus on that. Um, I, I overheard the conversation. Maybe others heard as well as far as the, the, the genre and subgenre. And um, what Dr. Boyette was saying was really good. We haven't really talked yet about all the intricacies about genre, subgenre. There will be a time later that we will discuss Again, because we're starting, I want to start early with the process. We just jumped into it. But 
I don't know if everyone was hearing what he was saying, but I really liked what he, he described. Genre is like the structure of, of, of like a building and you, you have different houses. I think he was saying that. I, I really like that analogy. That's a really good analogy. And so with genre and subgenre, you have different structures and also because there's different structures, there's different designs and there should be different expectations. So that really helps us um, and then, so that really helps us as we think about genre and subgenre. Yeah, that's very helpful. And I think also he brought up that you have subgenre is just uh, one one main genre is made made up of several smaller, and that's really the case too. Yeah, that's really really good. So, um, if, if for those who probably weren't here or, or maybe weren't here, is that a subgenre is a specific genre within a context. So for example, parable is, is a, is a subgenre within the, within the genre of gospel. You can have teaching discourse. So Jesus has teaching discourses, the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Plain, the Olivet Discourse. That's a subgenre within the larger genre of gospel. In, in epistles, you can have exhortation or theological discourse. I mean, there's different ways to call that argumentative discourse, but so uh, um, a, 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 the book of Hebrews is primarily, now he calls it an exhortation, but it's very much theological. It's a theological discourse. Same thing with Romans. So you really have these, uh, one book is composed of multiple uh, su sub genres and, and they really help in the understanding and expectations. Yeah, especially later when you make your outline. When you make your outline, it's going to be very helpful. So, man, I wish I wish Dr. Boyer could be with us all the time. He had some really good he had some really good information there. So, um, anyway, I, I do hope that you're not so stressed. And there's a lot of new terminology. I am using this terminology as well, so that because as you read, as you research, you're going to see these words, and so. That's just the reality of it. I know it's Henry brought up semantic, <laughs> semantic range. That was in the reading from Stein. So, you know, it's just the nature. It's, 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 we need to level up. And so it's not for our pride, but it is for our understanding. So um, this is a process. This is a journey. Um, so let's, let's, any questions or comments where we can get right into it? You want, want to jump right into it? Let me just check here if everyone's back. Okay, so now we're on to background study. We're on to the background study, and I do, want to, I do want to spend some time here because I want us to start our background study, and perhaps uh, we'll see if it's due next week, but I want you to start. Maybe it'll be for, it'll be, this will be assignments four and five, so I'll give you two weeks. I want you to do a good background study. Um, so maybe it will be due in two weeks, okay? Um, so with the background study, there are several things that, there are several important um, items that you really need to explore, and this helps in your understanding, okay? Now, some passages, some books of the Bible have less, and others have more, okay? So what you want to consider is authorship. So you want to be looking for authorship. Uh, all commentaries will give you, authorship or they will at least discuss the different possibilities for authorship you do need to be careful because some commentaries are more liberal so they would take a more liberal approach others would take a conservative approach so the big example is being for example ecclesiastes some of the more liberal commentaries would not accept um, solomon as the writer of ecclesiastes so those are things you need to be aware of they would say it's some other editor later in the later down down the line. Um, the same thing with Proverbs. The same thing with some of the other books. Uh, if you're reading in Isaiah, they will say there's first and second Isaiah. They actually say that. They they claim that because Isaiah 40 to 66 is so different, there's actually two Isaiahs, two different authors. And of course, we as conservatives would disagree with that. A strong piece of evidence. Uh, promoting the, the, the support that there's only one Isaiah is that when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered that were dated back even to like the second century BC. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found a book of Isaiah and it was unified. It was one. Uh, if they had found two different books, that would have been a huge case for two different Isaiahs. 
But when they looked up the Dead Sea Scrolls, it was just ginormous support for the unity of Isaiah that it was largely, it was largely the, one of the, the best copies. It was just one. It was one. So a lot of liberals were not happy when they discovered that. Because <laughs> it, it, it agreed with the fact that there's one Isaiah, not two. And uh, uh, audience, so audience is also important. Uh, uh, this, one of the biggest books that where the audience really matters is the book of Hebrews. Identifying the book of Hebrews as, um, as Hebrews it does have a certain significance in meaning. So audience is significant. So you always want to identify who the audience is of the book that you're investigating. Let's move on here. So audience is, is, is important date and location. So some it's impossible. Um, if you're investigating in the gospels, a lot of the commentaries will put the gospels later, but the gospels are early. And I, I'm really a big proponent of gospel, gospel dating being very early. Uh, there's there's really no reason to date the Gospels late, except you just don't accept the possibility that they could have been written, written early. Uh, but I, I really hold to all the Gospels being written, um, including John, before, before 70 AD. I am a big, and even earlier than that. So maybe you want to make a comment. I, I don't know. But, but yeah, so dating and, on, on, dating and location is can be important as well. Does anyone have a question or a comment? Oh, how would location affect an interpretation? It's just a place. Okay, so for example, in Revelation, uh, identifying, identifying the churches as literal churches in a literal context has a completely different interpretation than people that have taken it as like the epochs of church history. So they, they, there is an interpretation of the seven churches as that's, that's church history, the, the, the church to the, the history. When you actually do, uh, there was a, a Sir Ramsey, uh, Ramsey, um, J. Ramsey. There's an author who actually went and and every every single, of course, those those different churches are historical. But like even for example, in the to the Church of Thyatira, you're neither hot nor nor cold, but lukewarm. I'll spew out of out of out of my mouth. There's actually historical context the 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 the, the church of uh, sorry not Thyatira Laodicea Laodicea they they tried to pipe in the hot water and cold water by the time it got to Laodicea it was lukewarm it was nasty and so but but the big proof was that a lot of in church history they took the churches as the epcots the eras of the church they didn't take all those all those contexts literally. And and this this uh, scholar uh, um, archaeologist actually went and looked, and each one of those churches, those situations, there was a historical context behind it. So that would be a situation where the the location would matter. If you didn't hold to a strong location, you would interpret it. People have interpreted it wrongly. So that would be an example. But you're right; it is more minimal. It's not. It's not fundamental in every case. Oh boy. Um, that's, what yeah. that's what I thought. It has nothing to do with the theological principles or theory that is being expounded by the writer. Uh, can you just repeat? I, I lost that part. It has nothing to do with the theological principle that the writer is uh, talking about. Yes, except if you don't accept the place as literal. If you don't accept it as literal, then it would... It would impact so yeah but no you're right that that still looking at the context that doesn't affect the theology yeah that is true i was thinking that if jesus was not born in bethlehem it is not a fulfillment of the prophecy right oh yeah so 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 i no you're right so what bobo is saying is is concerning the look so the specific issue is the location of, of the writing of uh, the location of where the letter is written. That, that's what he's referring to. But no, you, but you're right that, that locations do matter. Yeah. Okay, purpose of the book. I, I think this is more important. Understanding the purpose of the book is very foundational, especially we're going to see in Romans. The purpose of the book is incredibly foundational. 
So these are things that you want to consider and include. Uh, now, I, I did not include all of these. I don't know if I include all of these in my, in my example. I wasn't meaning, and I think I said this last week, my example was not comprehensive. It was just an example of, what, of how you could write something. So you would want to include a lot of, a, a lot of these that I'm giving you. Um, composition of the audience. So whether it's Jew, whether it's Gentile, whether it's mixed, that's also of significance that you would want to explore. Uh, social issues. Political issues, religious issues, theological themes, and of course the main theme or topic. So these are background, these are issues that you would want to explore in your background study. Now what I would do is if, if I am writing, if I am writing, uh, if I am writing, what I would do is I would just have a bullet point, authorship, and then I would just fill in the blank audience and just fill in the blank social issues i look for any type of issues and just bullet point it out and then i would i would once you've done that research then you would just create your your uh your text next okay that's that's how i would do this i would just have a i would have a word document or a piece of paper with all these different things and then just do reading and research in the commentaries and then answer the questions. And then you can determine, oh, this is not important. I won't include it. I don't want you to include everything. I want you to include those things that are significant or you think that are significant. Okay? Because realistically, on a weekly basis, you cannot do a massive background study of every single message. You should strive for it, but you might not be able to. So uh, you need to pick and choose. Oh, this is significant. This, this helps my, this helps my meaning. This isn't so significant. And then there are other issues as well. So perhaps there's an issue that you, that I have not mentioned here. Okay. Moving on here. So, um, let's, let's practice in the context of Romans. So let's, what we're going to do is we're going to go back and investigate Romans one chapter 15 and 16, and just make some of these identifications. So let's go now to the, and I'll just highlight some of these things. So I don't want the commentaries to do all of your work. I think that you should do some of the work yourself. That's why I had you read your book already. And you want, I want you to try to answer some of the questions at the same time. Uh, the commentaries assist. So let's just work through here to see, to see um, how we can, we can kind of Look at the text, makes I highlight some of these things, and then also we can use commentaries as well. So as well. So just looking here, I do I you have this, this is the author, it's highlighted here. So that's something you can do just from, from reading. And and you do have you do have looking here, you have several highlights, right? So these are descriptions of the author. So in your background study, you could, I did not include this, but you could include that. One, two, three. So especially for Romans, we notice that Paul, that Paul talks about the gospel and his specific calling is focused upon the gospel. That he's a servant of Christ Jesus that he is also an apostle or he is a, a messenger. He is a messenger. Okay, so, so these, are, these are significances that you can include in your, in your background study. And then, of course, you can also find these in commentaries. Okay? Now, moving along here, we also look at, look at the audience here. Can we can we can we identify the audience? We have those in Rome. So this is the audience. And then look at this. Look at this. Uh, we have a description here for the audience. One and two. Oh, I'm sorry, you can't see that. Okay. So. This is, this is some exegetical work that we're doing ourselves. okay? So when you're looking to identify the author, um, my first question would be, did you go first to the commentaries or did you 
try to, to, to go to the text. So I would recommend try to go to the text first to, to, to see. Um, and then if you can't, the text doesn't have enough information, then you can go to, to commentaries. Several other things I noticed here is that look at the comparison between the two. Look at this. Look at that comparison. Do you notice a comparison there? Let me, I'm just gonna highlight this for us. What do you notice? What do you notice here? Called to be an apostle, called to be saints. I'm going to get a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit technical, uh, maybe a little bit. Uh, this is a verbal, this is a verbal idea. I want to ask a question here. Now, in fairness, the Greek is an adjective, it's, it's, it's an adjective, but, but the verbal idea is still contained in the adjective, a called, a called person, okay? So we're looking at, this is a, this is a verbal idea here. So let's, let me ask the question, uh, who is the actor? Who is the actor? That's an action. Called is an, is an action. Who is the actor? I think it's God. It's the father. Henry said God. <clears throat> it's still God. It's God who called. Yeah. Because, because does everyone see here? Uh, Paul, um, Paul is located here, right? Paul is the apostle. Someone else is calling him. <laughs> he can't call himself. Does everyone see that? So what I'm trying to get at is logically, logically, it's not Paul. It can't be. He's the one who was called. He, so Paul here, Paul is the object, if you're looking at this verbal action. Now, if we notice the benefit, though, look down here. The actor. So you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, this is a this might be a technical question or also historical and this is a this is some rabbiting scheme kind of question. Go ahead. How did Paul the Apostle rise up to the level as an apostle when we know that he was not there when Jesus was still living? He was not among the twelve disciples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How did he rise up to that level, and how do you, by the time, what are the, like, how do you, what are the categories of being an apostle? So, you were cutting it out a little bit, so just, let me repeat the question, you can clarify, um, or you could just text it if, it if it doesn't come back clear again. So what you're saying is, how did Paul rise to the level of apostle? Um, by the by, this time it was was that your question? Uh, I was saying we know the context, right? That yeah. the the Paul was called during the conversion in, in Acts chapter nine, yeah. and this was the time that Jesus Christ ascended to heaven, and, and there's a lot of things there. So I'm just I don't know how do we rise up to that level. There must be some sort of standards. Well, I think I think the way that he rose to that level was number one supernaturally. God called him. He was called. Jesus called him, and and he was chosen. And in many ways, uh, Ananias, who who led him, uh, maybe confirmed. We know the Christians were afraid, but when they saw their testimony, I think that you know the power transformed his life and he was a different man. And, and those who heard his testimony saw that he was different. And no doubt that, that the, the fact that he was, he had this vision that others heard and they heard, but they could not see. So, I mean, it was supernatural, but there's no other explanation for it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that it's like, it's really thinking about, yeah. <laughs> like, what could be yeah. historically how do you consider like disciple and apostle are two different things, right? Uh, 
they are used interchangeably. Disciple and apostle. No, yeah. So apostle is different as a category. As a, it's different than disciple. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But but coming back here, and so maybe this is connected with your question. Although although saints and apostle are different. Again, we're coming back. I'm just gonna. The, the the actor is the same though. It's God. And so there is, even though there is a unique calling here for each one, it's still, uh, it's not by ourselves. It's not the source. Is not the action of calling, is not coming from us. It's coming from from God. And so there is great significance here. Um, in this idea of, of a call to be saints, called to be an apostle. There's great significance there because it, it, it's dealing with, with the source who is God. And that'll have significance in, in our text that we'll study later. A any questions or comments on that? And, and Al, um, go ahead, yeah. Okay, can I add, all right. And I will read Acts chapter 13. Verse 2, while they were worshiping the Lord, okay, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul yes. for the work to which I have called them. <laughs> so from there, it started from there, it started that Paul, Saul become Paul, and he was sent. So the the if go, uh, going back to going back to the description of apostle in Romans chapter one, apostle means uh, a divinely appointed founder or. Yeah one sent as a messenger in, he was called yes that's uh, that was correct it was god who called paul to be his apostle not not paul not paul that he took pride in himself to be called as an apostle yeah yeah you, that's good yeah no, that's good. Yeah, and 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 again, the emphasis upon the divine calling. And what I, so what I'm trying to make in the correlation here is that Henry really emphasizes same with Alex this idea that God called, God appointed. It was God's choosing, not Paul. And and in and in some, maybe you don't want to. Maybe this is hard, or you know, but but you have the same for us. So what I'm trying to say is there's still great significance in the same way that God calls and sets apart Paul, he's called us to be saints. And so that's, that's powerful assurance. That's, 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 that's powerful. That's, that's very, that's very deep. But again, again, so the significance for our background study is that you have the audience here and the description of the audience you have the author and a description of the author. And, and we're doing this, this is exegetical work now. We're not using the commentaries, we're doing this ourselves. Uh, the next thing I wanna show here is that we can discover, we can discover the purpose. So I read down here verse eight. First, I thank God through Jesus Christ for all of you because of your faith that has been proclaimed in all the world for God is my witness who I serve in the spirit in the gospel of son without ceasing making mention you in my prayers asking somehow by god's will i may now at least succeed to come to you and this really gives the purpose this is the purpose we're going looking at the words we're seeing the purpose of paul for i long to see you what is the purpose so it looking specifically here uh this this is a desire. I long to see you. And then this conjunction here, this is a purpose clause. I long to see you what? That I might impart um, some spiritual gift so that he wants to give a spiritual gift to them. 
Um, uh, and he wants there to be a mutual encouragement, right? So there's this desire to be mutually encouraged. Then watch this. Verse 13, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers, that I often intended to come to you. But So again, he repeats himself. He wants to come. And so this is really going to be further clarified. This will be further clarified. So again, he, he states again, there is this. There is, again, this desire. And then look at this. Look, look at this second. This is, again, a purpose clause. What is the purpose? Now, now the ESV here uses harvest. But we could, we, the, other translations, if you look at other translations, this could also be translated fruit. He wants to have a fruit. He wants to have fruit among them. Does everyone see that? So this really, uh, you could identify this as the purpose of the book. Uh, this is really, this is just a clarification here. They're clarifying. And then look, how is he going, how is he going to have a harvest? How is he going to have a fruit? Uh, the way is going to be here. This is a therefore. What? How is he going to have? Oops. He is, this is again, this is, this is a desire, Diva. This really gets to the heart. There's three desires mentioned here. One. I long to see you. I long to come to you. Right? Number three, I, I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. And this is not to unbelievers. This is, this is to the audience. And this is connected with the harvest. So this, this gets to the heart of the gospel. The gospel is more than conversion. Look at this. He's, he's under obligation to Greeks, to barbarians, to wise and to foolish. So, so this is this is preaching to the the lost, diba. This is preaching to believers, or we could say to saints, for their fruit. Or for, so, what I'm trying to get at is there's a there's this also this sanctification. The, the gospel has benefit in our sanctification as well. Is everyone seeing that? Is everyone seeing that here? That um, the God, Romans is a letter. He doesn't say, go read this to the neighbors. He, he reads it. He writes it to believers. He wants, he wants to proclaim the gospel to believers. Because in the, the gospel has the power to transform. Um, and so what I'm trying to get out of here is that this is a background. Notice here, notice here that this is the, this is the uh, pre, uh, preceding context to, to our passage. Do you see that? And, and this, is, this, is in the, this is the foundation if you preach Romans 16 and 17 without setting up the context, Sayang. Sayang. So what I want us to see here is that identifying the purpose of Romans, that the primary purpose is the proclamation of the gospel. Um, you, you, you know, Henry asked earlier, if I get the wrong genre, will I mess it up? If you, if you get this wrong, you can mess it up. There's a good chance. There's a good chance. So that's why later, next week, we'll discuss the, the, 
the next step after background is the specific location of your text. And you're going to do a, a preceding context summary and a succeeding context summary. So I am trying to protect you from missing this. So you will summarize this preceding context. You will su summarize the succeeding context. So you, I'm really trying to orient you so that we read this in context, okay? And, and so you, you might say this whole process is so tedious, Tim. It's so, yes, it's so tedious because I don't want you to miss these other things. And one day, one day, tell a guy, you will just, it'll be natural. You, uh, Henry will give the assignment to Louis. Louis preached this sermon and you're gonna get, you're gonna read the text and immediately, you don't have to do this. You're just going to go to the preceding context. You're going to highlight just like we did. Succeed, da, 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 and then, okay, I'm ready to go. But until we get in this mindset, I'm really, I'm laying out just a very clear and concise uh, method for us. But I want us to see here is that now in your text, it might be harder. If you're doing first, uh, second Peter or second Peter three or in James, maybe it's far, it's farther to find the beginning. Or maybe it's close. Um, or maybe the purpose is not so clear. This is a very clear purpose, okay? So fair enough. But I want us to be thinking about this, that in, in your process, we're both looking at commentaries, but we're also doing our own exegetical work, okay? We're, we're doing both. I don't want you just to go to commentaries and read. I want you to do the work yourself, okay? When you get stuck, then you can go to a commentary, okay? I want us to think exegesis first, work first, and then the commentaries are a backup. What time is it now? Okay, it's already 9.05. It's so late. Okay, so what I want you to do is I want your assignment that won't be, I want you to work on this. I'm not, I'm not going to assign it next week. Uh, some of you have, have missed the assignment for this week. That's fine. Your assignment, let's, let's, go to, let's go to the end of the PowerPoint here. Okay, homework. So what I want us to do is, okay, this will be assignment number, we'll just make it number four. We'll make it number four, number five, okay? Because I'll add to, I'll add, okay, just assignment number four lot. Assignment number four, okay? But this will not be due next week, but I want you to be working. Number one, I want you to be working on finding resources. Number two, I want you to start your background study. So we've done enough work. We've done some background. I've given you some ideas. I want you, I want you to be thinking about having five sections, five, five of that, of that whole list. I want, I want you to pick five, have five or, or, or five sections with, or five paragraphs if you're CT, you can do bullet points. If you're MAT, MATC, I want sentences. So what I'm thinking about is, what I'm looking for is five sections or five paragraphs at four sentence per. So you should be thinking 20 sentences of information of a background study, okay? It can be author, it can be date, it can be purpose, it can be social issues, it can be audience, it can be type of audience, it can be political issues, okay? Someone's doing Second Peter. Uh, there is a lot of false teachers. You can talk about false teachers in the background of the of the of the, of the epistle. Um, James. You can talk about issues dealing with with trials and wealth and 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 and, and there with um uh, with with Mark. There's a, so there's a lot of different there's a lot of different trajectories you could go. I want you to start digging deep. I want you to go deep. I want you to do your this this requires several things. Number one, you should be reading the book, reading your own passage, and doing some of the work, highlighting different things. But you also should be reading as well. We will, 100%, we will have a workshop this Saturday with research, helping you to find those commentaries. So you should be doing it on your own. Um, if, you, if you're looking for some good commentaries you don't have, send me a private email. We will help you find some good commentaries. Okay, worst comes to worst. I will help get some for you, okay? Um, but let's focus on this, on this, uh, this background study. I want a good introduction. I want a good conclusion, bringing some of these ideas together or highlighting how they can benefit in your study. I will post tomorrow morning. I will post this 
with an example and with the example that I gave you. I will have an example in a paragraph and a bullet point, bullet point form. So I'll give you two examples, paragraph and bullet point, okay? Let's just, we're, we're just slow pace, we're going slow, okay? Um, the other thing is that I will post the application. Even if you're just going to attend, if you just want their certificate of attendance, Nalang, I want you to fill out an application so that we have records, okay? Uh, we have a record of, of your, um, uh, for our, for our uh, academic purpose because EVST, by the grace of God, we want it to become eventually, um, there's different accreditations, there's Cheddar accreditation, there's, I think, Pavet's, Pavet's accreditation, there's possible ATA accreditation. We, but the critical thing is we need, to be, we need to have good records. I'm working on the teacher and the administrative ends to create, um, I'm creating, uh, even though we're online, some people like to see the physical, the physical uh, uh, book. So we're creating, we're, we're creating um, manuals for both the courses and for administration. We are, we are going to do this with excellence, okay? And so part of that excellence is the students turning in an application of, of admission. So your only assignment next week is to submit that application of admission. I will give you, I will give you some, um, it's, it's required. So if you don't submit it, I will take points off. Okay. So it's easy. I will post the, the, uh, the, the application it's free points towards your class. Okay. So maybe it'll be worth five points, whatever I, I determine. Okay. But just fill out the application. You can do, you can do MAT, MATC, whatever you've already signed up for CT, or if you can't, if you can't do where you're at and you want to step down to just a certificate of attendance, that's fine. So let's say you were enrolled in the, the CT, but you can't do the assignments. Just step down to a certificate of attendance. Along. Next semester in the future, you can change, but at least, at least get that minimum certificate so that by the end of this program, you can say you have something to show for it and, and you've really received the knowledge. Okay. At this time, I'm just going to, I'll open this up for any comments or, 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 or questions. We didn't do the reading. I'm thinking about maybe scheduling another time for those who, who did the reading that would like to discuss. Um, and then we can just post the video online. I'm thinking about that. For those who want to discuss the reading, um, I'll send a separate message out that we can plan. Any comments or questions at this yeah. point? Good. Clarification. Uh, the five sections or five paragraphs. Uh, yeah. Does it refer to a commentary or a text or a passage in the Bible of our choice or, or the same passage that we choose earlier? Okay, when I'm referring to five sections or five paragraphs, that's the, that's the amount of writing for your background study, Kuya Boboy. So I'm looking for, when I look at your, of course I'm looking at your content, but I'm looking, did he write five paragraphs in his background study? In each paragraph, are there at least four sentences? I'm looking for that level of content, minimum, okay? So if you had four paragraphs, good content, great, but you're only gonna get at the most, um, maybe a 20 out of 25 or a 15 out of 20 because you, I'm looking for that amount of work. So some people would say two pages. I'm just saying five paragraphs minimum at four sentences per. If you had, if you had one paragraph with three sentences, one paragraph with five sentences, fine. But I'm so I'm looking for at least twenty sentences or twenty bullet points of information. Okay. Yeah. So this is uh, double space, sir, Tim. Yes, double space. So whether it's bullet point or whether it's paragraph, I want double space so that I can make comments. I can make comments underneath it. Yeah. The other thing is I've changed. Did everyone see the change in formatting for the last assignment? And I also posted the, the template. Has, did anyone use that template for this assignment number three? Did anyone use that template or no? I, I, used, I used the new format that you yeah. gave. Uh, Danny sent it to me. Great, great. I'll, I'll repost that again. That new format is really the CGST formatting, and I like it. There's more information there. It's very nice. It's beautiful. So we're going to follow that format moving forward. 
I put a template on Facebook groups. Here, let's just go to Facebook groups really quick. I wanna show, I wanna show you something. So let's just go to Facebook groups. I do wanna show you this so that everyone can see how beautiful this is. Uh, Facebook groups is awesome. Let me just come here really quick. EVST, so we're, we're into EVST here. Everyone can see that. Now, if you look here in the group, there's across the top, everyone sees that, you see about, you see discussions, you see rooms, you see members, you see events, you see media, you see files. All you do is you click on file, and then all the files that I have posted are there. And you can organize this based on, you can adjust that to, to based on, um, you should be able to do it in chronological order and time as well. Okay, it's not letting me here. But in your, I know for sure in Google Chrome, if you have Google Chrome, you can click on file name and it will put it in alphabetical order. So if you look here, um, this here is assignment number three. Um, and then I can just click on it and there's assignment number three. Okay. So there's access. Let me come back here. Let me come back here. What I'll do is I will also post this on our, on our Facebook messenger page, but I have a format where you can literally just plug, you can just plug in, you can just plug in your name and information. Okay. So this is the format moving forward. I really like this because I can put all my comments. It's nice and neat. I can put the grade here. We have all the information. This is the way we're gonna do it moving forward. It's very nice, it's very nice. And it's already set up. It'll already be double spaced. It'll have this already in there. And all you have to do is just type in your information. Okay, but this will be the format that we're using moving forward. All right, any other comments or questions? It's late, it's really late. I appreciate you bearing with me. And um, we will try to be more strict moving forward. We're gonna start at six and we're gonna end at nine. So I do apologize for us going a little bit over. And um, I'll make the adjustment to make sure that we cut it. And um, I appreciate you bearing with me. And I do want to really emphasize, I'm just going to close in prayer and, and, pr and pray for all of you tonight. I know that perhaps some of you are tired and some of you are very stressed. And I, I don't want you to be stressed. Um, I, haven't, I haven't taken any points off for anyone being late yet. Even some have uh, maybe not turned in the right assignment. Again, you know, I haven't taken really any points off either. If, you've, if I've asked you to resubmit, and maybe there were some points, if you resubmit, I'll give you the points back. I don't want people to be stressed. I don't want people to, uh, to be afraid. This, is, this semester is an adjustment. We're in COVID, we're, we're, we're on the internet, and so um, you know, we just need to level up, but we're, we're, we're slowly gonna do this together. I don't want anyone to be left behind as long as we're committed to, to trying and to doing our best. Um, we want to, to put you in a place to, to succeed. And maybe some of you are you're just max in work and you want to step down to a certificate of, of attendance. That absolutely, I, I don't want you to be stressed. Just do certificate of attendance. You can watch the videos, you can take the information, but you don't have to do any of the assignments. Um, just consider that. So next week, this week, I want you to, to work on turning in your assignments that are late. I also want you to be starting your background study send me an email if you have questions. We're gonna have a research uh, workshop this Saturday. If you can't attend, don't worry, we'll load it onto YouTube. And then also, your application of admission. EVST is open officially, and, and it was great to see Dr. Boyet here, and we're hoping that this, this will be a long-term partnership. We're so excited, and um, uh, by God's grace. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to pray a special prayer. I ask forgiveness of our sins and, and the sins of, of all of us. Father, we fall short of your glory and we're tired. I know the students are maybe, uh, some of them are maybe uh, stressed, maybe they're discouraged. Some of the words are, are big that are used here, Father God. But Father, at the same time, we know that it's through these difficult times that we grow. It's not doing through the easy times, it's through those difficult times, Father God. And I know that your spirit is working through this and we are seeing new truths. Father, we want to proclaim your word. We want to teach your word. We want to have small groups that faithfully uh, share your word, Father. And so I pray that this class would be uh, just an eye-opener 
that, that the students would learn to put into practice these, these principles. And, and Father God, I, I have complete confident, confidence that if the, that the students put these into practice, they will be your faithful, faithful servants. And uh, even, if, even if maybe their ministries don't experience success by worldly standards, uh, we know that there will be eternal success, that there will be mature believers that will be led and brought into maturity. We know, Father God, that on that last day, you will say to each one of these students, well done, my good and faithful servant. So, Father God, I pray that we would put our, 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 um, our hands to the plow, that we would look forward and not behind, that we would not look to, to the side, but we would keep our eyes fixed on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. It's in Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things in faith through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.